Okay, so now we have Christian Jensen from University of Victoria who will tell us about uh, large models of platforms. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, my first act with the, the talk today is uh, along the lines of a couple of the talks that we saw yesterday to, to change the title a little bit. This is the title that I was given, uh, that I gave rather to the organizers some time ago, but I want to, to modify it slightly to something resonant with the panel yesterday and Sans talk um, to large N uh, models with exotic symmetry, which is a little hard to <laughs> write down. Uh, with... Yeah, okay, I'm not even gonna try to do that. But okay. Um, uh, okay. Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to come. Uh, it's lovely to be here. This has been a great meeting. Uh, the talk that I am giving today is based off of a paper that Amir Ross, who's in the audience, uh, and I wrote back in May, as well as some work in progress. Um, so let's get into it. Um, why am I changing the title of this talk on the fly? Uh, well, the focus of this talk really is about quantum mechanical models, either in the lattice or in the continuum, of matter with exotic symmetry. For instance, dipole symmetry or subsystem symmetry, um, and especially the role of interactions within these quantum mechanical systems. Uh, different people mean different things by the word fractons, which is why I'm trying to avoid it in the title. Uh, so, for instance, you know, by coupling some of these models to a tensor gauge theory, some of these models can sometimes lead to what some people call fractons. <laughs> I just want to avoid this, these kinds of um, uh, discussions. Of course, they're very interesting and worthwhile, uh, but I, I just want to focus today on, on what's going on with matter and interactions. Um, so to illustrate why I'm considering this topic, uh, let's consider a very simple scalar effective field theory, which is invariant under well, on some of these exotic symmetries. So I want to linear, so I have a scalar, I'm gonna call it phi, because that's what we call scalars. Um, and I want to linearly realize a number of symmetries, some that we're used to and one that is a bit newer to us. So the ones I want to realize are translations, rotations, u1. So phi is going to be complex. It'll rotate by a phase. Uh, and then here's the newbie. So I want to realize a dipole symmetry. How do I do this? How do I realize the symmetry? And how do I write down Lagrangians that are invariant under it? This is a problem that was solved by Pretko uh, some years ago. And the way it works is like this. Uh, so the way that the dipole symmetry is going to be realized is in this way on phi. So phi is a field, depends on space and time. And it'll shift by an x-dependent phase under a dipole transformation. Dipole transformation is here what I'm calling d vector not saying what space D vector is living in right now. We can come to that later. Um, well, here is an action that is invariant under uh, all of these transformations. Um, so I'm, I'm, well, almost everything I'm going to do in the talk is going to be an imaginary time tau. So I have a tau here. Um, I have D spatial directions. So that's the D tau D dx. And then, you know, I can have terms with time derivatives. That's fine. I can have a potential term that uh, depends on phi complex square. But when it comes time to write down terms with spatial derivatives, well, now we're in a pickle. Uh, the sort of conventional uh, spatial kinetic terms that you might write down, spatial derivative of phi complex square, those are in fact forbidden by the symmetry. The simplest things that we can write down with spatial derivatives have at least four powers of the fundamental field. So I've written down uh, one such term over here, and then I've included dots because, of course, you know you can just keep going. You can write down many terms with many derivatives and many powers of the fields. But the absolute, you know, if you if you follow the sort of uh, guide that maybe the most important things that we should include are terms with a low number of fields and a low number of derivatives then the simplest kinds of terms you would write down with spatial derivatives have two derivatives and four powers of the fundamental field. And so if we want to write down um, quantum mechanical models of field theory, 
where degrees of freedom at different spatial positions can talk to each other, you necessarily then need spatial derivatives. Um, while the effective field theory that we would use to describe such physics is necessarily non-Gaussian. And now I could draw an arbitrarily large number of question marks. What do we do? Um, if we, you know, here's some options for what you might do when you're confronted with this question. Um, option one that you might take is, you know, suppose you're, you're, oh, go ahead. There's a question in the audience. So I think the, the component of the role is actually what happened on the larger symmetry of the arbitrary function. So just the air function with the arbitrary function. Um, the one that I wrote, so it depends on, on, um, yeah, yeah, thank you. It's going to take a bit to get used to. So the question is, is whether or not the Lagrangian here is invariant under more symmetry than, uh, just this dipole symmetry. And the answer is, well, there are dots. <laughs> That's one answer, um, that can, that can, uh, break whatever other symmetries this might be invariant under. Uh, but there's uh, another comment, which is that, um, you know, I, I'm how to say the, the simplest term that I'm writing down here involves a complex coupling lambda whose real part indeed preserves a much larger symmetry, but whose imaginary part does not. Yeah, but you, you can feel the imaginary part by here's the summation acting on the time you use the term. Um, if there are other, if there are dots, then yes, there is some, uh, you can try to get rid of the imaginary part of lambda, but um, okay, then those, those terms can also, will, will break, uh, say, higher multiple symmetries. Uh, John, your, your hand was up for a moment and then it disappeared. Did you yeah, still? Yeah, thanks. So I, I was wondering what, um, what about the uh, Laplacian? Phi square complex squared term. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's your opinion on that? Is that in the dots? And why is it less relevant than the one you wrote? Uh, Laplacian, oh, uh, Laplacian phi complex square also violates the, the symmetry, this dipole symmetry. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't, isn't, isn't D dot X harmonic? Uh, the, the simplest way to, let's see, um, I wasn't planning on going this direction, so Sorry. maybe, um, no, no, I, it, uh, there's a simple way, how to say, um, there's a fairly simple algorithm to, to kind of figure out what terms are invariant and which terms aren't, um, and so that you can write down all of the terms allowed by symmetry, provided that one goes to momentum space rather than position space. It's much easier to, to do this in, in, uh, in, in that picture. And uh, I, I can describe how it works, but maybe it would take a little more time than I want to spend right now, so. Okay, I'll think about it, thanks. Yeah, I can explain the details later. But uh, you, know, you can really prove that there are no Gaussian terms with higher derivatives, uh, higher spatial, uh, that involve spatial derivatives that are invariant. Uh, under the symmetry. So what are some options then, uh, if you want to understand the, you know, what's going on in these models uh, with these uh, non-Gaussian terms with spatial derivatives? Um, well, if your potential is kind of uh, like what I'm drawing here, you know, uh, no minimum away from zero, uh, something that you might try to do, this is really a, uh, you know, twist your fingers, I guess you can see that on the zoom, and hope for the best kind of an approach, is to try to treat these uh, higher interactions uh, perturbatively and see what happens. Shut up and calculate. Um, effectively, when you do this, you expand around a quadratic model that has no spatial derivatives whatsoever. It has time derivatives, might have a quadratic potential. Um, in which case your free field propagator that you would get from this is just a function of omega, not k. And well, now things are very tricky. It's not clear how to proceed because what do you do when you try to make sense of loop integrals or your propagators uh, that run around the loop? That's tricky. Another thing that you could try to do is to tune your potential, say give up on the case where your potential is, is like this and, and do something with like a Mexican hat potential um, to try to force symmetry breaking. 
Um, you might then hope in that case that there is some weakly coupled sigma model description of the, the phase of your scalar. And indeed, there are such Lagrangians that are consistent with the symmetry. Uh, the Lagrangian that Son wrote down in his talk yesterday was of this sort. Um, but at some level, this is also a twist your fingers and hope for the best kind of approach. There's a question, you know, when you write down a tree level potential, there's a question, what about radiative corrections? Do they lift the potential? Do they leave it there alone? Um, and it's unclear how to address that question a priori. At least it's unclear to me. So what a, uh, a third approach that one can take to, to get some handle on these questions is the one that we took in our paper and the one that led to the title of this talk, the method of large n. So what you can do is, is you can replace your, you can change the question until you can answer it. Um, instead of, uh, which is a time-honored tradition in our field. So uh, we're going to replace the, the theory that we started with, the theory of a single phi, by a theory of an n-component phi, n-complex scalars, where n is going to be much, much larger than one. And when we do this, well, in addition to enforcing rotations, translations, and so on, let's do the simplest thing. We'll also enforce a UN global symmetry, whose U1 subgroup will enforce associated uh, dipole symmetry. And now it's, it's as easy to write down Lagrangians of this sort as it was for the single scalar. And you know, here I've, I've written down uh, one such example where now I have a, a bunch of phi's and in, repeated indices imply a sum over those. And of course, there's more complicated models. And the, the nice thing about writing down models of these sort is that they are soluble to leading order in one over n expansion. Um, essentially, by a more sophisticated version of what people did in the 70s, I won't say how many years that was before I was born, um, uh, to solve the vector models, to solve the ON models. So there you may recall when, um, you know, when you solve the, the ON vector model, say with the quartic interaction, um, that what the way you proceed is by uh, uh, integrating in a scalar field, call it sigma, um, which is essentially the, the norm squared of your n component vector. And when you do that, you can uh, decouple the, the, the quartic interaction. You end up with a uh, Lagrangian that is, um, how to say, where you can integrate out the scalars and you get a weakly coupled effective theory of this mode sigma. Here, that doesn't work because these quartic interactions are not, you know, they, um, they're not the square of something. So you can't uh, introduce a single local field to decouple the interaction. What you do instead is the next best thing you integrate in bilocal degrees of freedom. So for instance, something you can do is you can integrate in a field that I will call G, because its expectation value will be the large F Green's function, um, which is bilocal. It depends on two field, um, on shell, it's two fields, phi bar at x1 and phi at x2, and you sum over all the values of A. And if you want to integrate in such a field with that definition on shell, then you need an extra Lagrange multiplier degree of freedom to enforce that. And that's what we're going to call sigma. We'll call it sigma because it will be the large end self energy. Uh, to give um, a flavor of how this works and why it's useful, um, the, the, you know, the, these quartic interactions with spatial derivatives, you can uh, Fourier transform them, write them in momentum space. There's some integral over four momenta with a momentum conserving delta function um, times an interaction that is a polynomial in momenta because the original configuration space action had spatial derivatives. And then, you know, you have phi, phi, phi bar, phi bar in momentum space, but you can replace that by G squared, essentially in momentum space. G is phi bar phi at two different points. And in so doing, you can convert a theory and it's quartic in uh, a term, it's quartic in phi to one that's quadratic in G albeit with this uh, tricky uh, momentum space uh, prefactor. And the nice thing, the reason why you do this is that G and Sigma are the weakly coupled uh, collective degrees of freedom that describe this large end system. On general grounds, large end models are 
you expect to be weakly coupled in some degrees of freedom. It's just you go have to go and find the right ones. For n equals four super yang mills, the right collective degrees of freedom and strong coupling are you know fluctuations of supergravity in ten dimensions. Um, here, the right uh, weakly coupled degrees of freedom are these g sigma. And you know we didn't invent this this method. Of course, this goes back a while. This method has been used to great effect in solving chern simons matter theories in the Atuk limit, which, uh, for instance, Tarun uh, referenced in his talk yesterday, as well as the SYK model. So what do we do using this then? Well, we solve these models uh, to leading order in large N as a function of temperature and chemical potential. Chemical potential here being a certain quadratic term in the, the potential uh, V in these models. Um, how do we do that? Well, these models are um, weakly coupled at large N, which means they're effectively classical. They have equations of motion for these weakly coupled degrees of freedom, G sigma. And well, we solve those equations of motion and thereby find the large N Green's function. You can compute the action of that solution, and that action well approximates the thermal partition function for that solution. And you can thereby access, you know, what's the, the thermodynamics of this model, at least to leading order in large n. Um, what are, how do you actually solve these equations? Um, well, you, you first make a, an ansatz that your G sigma preserve translations, they depend on two positions and in momentum space, two momenta, two ansatz that you preserve translations. Um, and now you're down to functions of a single variable. And those, the ensuing equations that you get, they're actually the Dyson equations for the Green's function and self-energy, which approximately truncate at large n. Here, those become the actual equations of motion for G sigma. And well, what happens? Um, those equations of motion, how do they read? Well, they read like this. G is what looks like a standard propagator with a single time derivative in these models, one over I omega plus, well, what we would call a self-energy. That's what, why we call it sigma, since it appears as a self-energy here. Um, and then um, what, we, what we do is, is we do something that uh, you would also do in the vector model context um, you allow for the possibility of a condensate that breaks UN down to UN minus one. And that's what I'm calling little sigma. It's just an ordinary complex number. And it gives me a condensate in the sense that it multiplies just a moment, um, a delta function, delta K equals zero in the Green's function. Um, then we have another, I, I should stress too, it's, I guess the way I describe that, it sounds like we're putting it in by hand that really comes from the uh, when, you know from the original uh, collective field theory for G sigma. We integrate out n minus one of the scalars instead of all n, and the residual one that we leave behind is what we call sigma. We get another dice, another two equations because we have three variables: G sig, big sigma, and little sigma. Um, the, there's a Dyson equation for the self energy, which relates it to a quadratic term and the potential and a momentum integral. Um, and then there's a common state term. And the right way to think about this equation for the self-energy is that it's, uh, you can represent it diagrammatically. Let's say that the self-energy is given by a loop integral of the sort that I'm drawing here, where the, the vertex is the, oh, where the vertex is this quartic interaction of the model, um, we amputate the external legs and the propagator that runs around the loop is the exact large end propagator. And what this does in practice, this sums up an infinite class of diagrams in the original model. It sums up diagrams with a single bubble and two bubbles and three bubbles and so on up into the sky. Instead of turtles on top of turtles, there's bubbles. Um, so, and then there's a, a final equation that says that, well, basically if we have the condensate, then the self energy at zero momentum is zero. It's like saying there's no, um, say, yeah, saying the, that there's, uh, that the, the 
non-local part of the propagator is gapless, which is what you would expect. And what do you do? Well, you solve these equations as a function of temperature and chemical potential. Uh, temperature appears through the spectrum of uh, through a spectrum of Matsubara modes, mu through a certain term and the potential. Um, and then we we not only have the solutions, but we compute their leading large n action. If we have more than one solution at the same value of t and mu, we figure out which one has smaller action. That tells us that that's the dominant phase, and we map out the ensuing phase diagram. And this is all actually quite easy. Um, it's so easy that 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 we that I can do it uh, in, in models at least with two spatial derivatives, and Amir can do it in models with more, um, because the the and maybe I'll, I'll say this. You know, there's there's a trick when you solve these integral different uh, equations. Uh, you need to kind of figure out cleverly what the dependence of self energy on momentum and frequency got to be. And here, the thing that saves you is that um, the the loop integral involves a dummy momentum k prime that I'm, is what I'm calling it, and the only dependence on the external momenta comes from the vertex. And the vertex in momentum space is just a polynomial in spatial momenta. And what this tells you is self energy is frequency independent and it's a polynomial of finite degree in spatial momenta. And so then you basically have a finite number of terms in that polynomial and you can relate this nasty integral equation, you can break it up into a finite set of algebraic equations involving integrals. Much like how things go in turn Simons matter. Another thing that we do in our paper is we obtain large end lattice models, which are just as soluble as these models we're writing directly in the continuum. And these large end models have the feature that for order one temperatures and chemical potentials, um, we, can, we can show quite simply that the, that the solution of the lattice model has a good continuum limit. And that good continuum limit is precisely the solution of the Dyson equations of the continuum model. In other words, the leading large end solution of these models has a good continuum limit. There was a question from oh. Johnny in the chat. Oh, sorry. I meant, yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, thanks. Yeah, sorry. About, about your solution of this field theory, does the fact that you ge generate a momentum dependent self energy mean that the dipole symmetry is spontaneously broken? I mean, since you, you wow. told me that there were no quadratic terms invariant under that. Yeah, yeah, that is, um, you anticipated exactly where I'm going in this talk, so. Okay, okay, I'll be patient, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, well, yeah, I can compliment you with a very astute observation, so. Um, indeed, that's where we're going. So, um, right, so, the third observation, um, the third thing that we get is the phase diagram, as I mentioned. And let me draw sort of roughly speaking what it looks like at finite but very, very small lattice spacing. What it looks like, uh, at least in, in more than two dimensions, we can do all this in two dimensions. It's just um, that there's, there's it's, it's a little slightly different. Um, in, high, in above two dimensions, we have three phases, basically. Um, and I'm calling them one, two, three here, and I'll go through them one at a time. Um, the first one, well, and maybe I'll, I'll remind that the potential that we're dealing with in these models is a quartic one. Minus mu phi squared, where mu is chemical potential. So when mu is positive, this is a potential of Mexican hat form. One expects um, condensation in high enough dimension that that's allowed. And that's indeed what we find. We find in, um, in this simple uh, model, at least with two derivatives, that uh, for positive chemical potential and sufficiently, uh, well, for order one temperatures, that we get a phase where there's a condensate and the Green's function look, takes this form. Phase two, uh, and so in that phase, un is broken to un minus one. We get another phase uh, 
So this is one at uh, basically at higher temperature or also at um, uh, negative chemical potential. So that would be the case where the potential is just strictly positive. There's no well away from zero. This is the thing that we could not access via perturbation theory in these uh, funny higher, uh, in these funny non-Gaussian couplings. Um, in that phase, the fate at large n is that there's no condensate. So un is preserved. Um, and the Green's function assumes this form that you know, has, is quadratic in momenta. I'm just labeling it here by two constants, A1 and A0. Um, and then, but then there's a third phase. And this third phase appears in two different places. Place one where it appears is along the negative chemical potential axis at exactly zero temperature. So there, what happens is the, this, this coefficient, the momentum dependent part of the self energy tends to zero. So you get a Green's function that's exactly momentum independent. Um, there, the constant term is just fixed by the chemical potential. And while well, that, that same momentum independent self energy appears at sufficiently high temperature at very extreme regions in the phase diagram where our temperatures, chemical potentials are of order one over the lattice spacing. Those are the phases, that's what we find. What's the physics of this? Well, this first phase where we have condensation, UN is getting broken to UN minus one. It's a gapless phase. One expects a sigma model description at low energy, although actually deriving that directly from the large end model is quite hard and something we hope to do someday uh, if we're strong enough. Um, what about the other phases? Well, there's this one where UN is preserved uh and the sub, the green's function has some momentum dependent form and as john very astutely observed that phase breaks dipole symmetry one way to see this is that the the these phi's um how does the dipole transformation look well it's you know multiplication by some phase factor um, but if you follow what that looks like in momentum space, what that looks like is that the momentum space field, its momentum shifts under a dipole transformation. So K goes to K plus D. And if you track what this means for the Green's function, it means the same thing for that. The uh, uh, G of omega K shifts, K shifts by K to K plus D. In other words, the dependence of the Green's function on spatial momentum serves as an order parameter for dipole breaking. There's no like local operator that can detect the breaking of dipole, but the Green's function, it's not local, it can detect that breaking. Maybe one way of thinking about this is that the Green's function in operator language, what does it do is it inserts an elementary dipole into your system with phi at one and phi bar at two. Now this phase, it's dipole breaking um, this is related to the things that appeared in Andy's talk uh, just a few minutes ago. Naively, you might think it's gapped from looking at the large n Green's function as a constant term in it. However, because the dipole symmetry is broken, at least if you're in, in uh, infinite volume, you expect there to be a Goldstone boson associated with the symmetry breaking one that would arise at subleading order in one over n, so there would be three such modes. And in fact, you then anticipate that this, uh, this mode is gapless, oh, sorry, this phase, this dipole breaking phase is gapless rather than gapped. It's just you don't see it at leading order in large n. And lastly, there's this phase where the self energy is momentum independent. And there, all the symmetries are preserved. Green's function is trivial. One expects there to be no transport whatsoever. It's an insulating gapped phase. Well, there's quite a bit of, um, okay. So there, there's, there's actually, okay, that's the phase diagram that we find qualitatively speaking. Um, in two dimensions, I guess, since I, I said that, uh, what happens is we don't get a condensed phase. We just get a dipole breaking phase and then an insulating phase. And that's, the, that's it. And I guess I should stress that this dipole breaking phase, this is um, genuinely new as far as I can tell. It's a phase that 
if you track it, the dependence of uh, the solution on the parameters in the original Lagrangian, it's non-analytic in these funny uh, non-Gaussian couplings. And so you would say it's inaccessible in perturbation theory. You really need to sum up all of these diagrams in large n to find this space. Uh, good. So one other piece of physics that's related to this dipole. Oh, go ahead. Uh, for, a, uh, like uh, so we, we have models. And so the question in the audience is uh, whether or not that state, the statements I'm making are true in models with two derivatives or four derivatives. Um, what happens is, is that, how to say, um, the short answer is they're true in all those cases. I'm presenting results for the simplest models, but we have models with four derivatives as well. And indeed there, the, 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 the um, how to say, um, what happens is, is maybe one way to see it is that if we can treat the low temperature limit at negative chemical potential analytically, you can solve these Dyson equations analytically in that regime. And when you do so, you find that the solutions have a non-analytic dependence on these uh, non-Gaussian couplings, quite generically. Does that does that answer? So the same the same? Qualitatively, they're the same. John, you had a question. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I'm I'm confused about something. So your system has translation symmetry, charge conservation, and dipole symmetry. Yes. Um, does does that mean that they satisfy this the same algebra that Andy was talking about, um, where um, momentum and dipole symmetry commute to the charge? Uh, yes. Yes, it does. So, but the, so Andy made a claim that that meant that the dipole symmetry was always broken, something like that. Is that consistent right. with the existence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that that claim actually. Um, there's an appendix of our paper where I mean maybe this was worked out before, but. Um, you know, you can ask whether the, like, from the, you know, if you have a symmetry algebra and you talk about the, and even like the lattice version of that symmetry algebra, and you can ask how do, uh, what is the Hilbert space of such a theory with that symmetry algebra look like? What, what are the representations of the symmetry? And indeed, they, they, all the representations with non-zero charge have that property that there's basically, how to say, in a lattice regularization, there's as many states in the, that ear rep as there are lattice sites. This is what I'm, one of the things that I'm about to discuss, actually. Um, and how to say, um, is that can look like an infinite number of states in the continuum. Where was I going with this? Um, it, physically, it's a very simple statement. It's uh, maybe uh, one way of saying it, that what that algebra really means, is P and D commuting to the charge, is that if you put a charge here and you translate it by one unit, you change the dipole moment. That's all that algebra means. And if you have a charge eigenstate of definite momentum, you act with the dipole, uh, with a dipole transformation on it, it just has the effect of shifting the momentum. So that, uh, and then you, you fill out an ear rep that has all possible allowed values of momentum. And that would lead to as many states as, as you have momenta and in a finite volume lattice regularization, that's just the number of lattice sites. So is, is that consistent with the existence of this sort of vegetable phase? Yes. So that's what I, yeah, yeah. So. Indeed, um, the, the, indeed, you, you're anticipating the flow of this talk. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> again, <laughs> that's where we're going. Um, I mean, maybe one way of motivating that line of discussion is we can say, well, if we have this dipole symmetry and we have a large end solution that breaks the dipole symmetry, then there are many more solutions related to it by symmetry. You can ask, what does that mean? How many solutions are there? What does that mean for the thermodynamics and so on? Um, and well, okay, uh, exactly what we're saying here. If, if, if you have a solution for the Green's function, then that depends on spatial momentum, then you get a bazillion other solutions as well. 
um, where uh, that are labeled by these dipole transformations D. And here we have to stop and slow down and be careful. A theme of uh, the, the panel yesterday and of uh, various talks that you will see on fractons is that of UVIR mixing and sent long wavelength sensitivity to an underlying lattice. And so far, none of that has appeared in the talk, really, but it was kind of waiting, hiding in the background, coming to jump at us, and here it is. Now we have to confront it. Um, so nowhere did we deal with such sensitivities in arriving at the large end solution. As I said, the, the lattice models that we write down have a good, con the large end solution of those models has a good continuum limit for any one such solution. However, the symmetry that we're dealing with that relates many different solutions to each other does depend on these kinds of details. Like, are you in finite volume or infinite volume? Do you have a lattice or are you in the continuum? And the way it depends on it is precisely through this, uh, these dipole transformations D. They're valued in the same space as single particle momenta, clearly. Um, and that space of momenta depends on, well, what we're doing. If we're in the continuum in infinite volume, those transformations are valued in uh, RD. If we're in the continuum and on a torus, then they're discretized and they're valued in a torus. If we're on an infinite volume lattice, then they're valued in a, you know, a continuous Brillouin zone, which is, it's, or sorry, when I said before a continuum torus, I meant uh, they're valued on you know, Z, on a, on a lattice, really. If our space time, our uh, spatial directions are a spatial lattice in infinite, of infinite extent, then these Ds live in a finite volume torus. And finally, if our underlying space is a lattice of finite volume, then these Ds are actually discretized and have finite extent. They live in the reciprocal lattice. And this, well, this is a consequence. This has observable physics for us, even in our large end model, because, well, we have in these dipole breaking phases many solutions related by symmetry. And how many solutions we have uh, depends on this, this particular uh, subtlety. In other words, the, there is indeed in these large end models uh, UV IR mixing, but it seems to be related. Uh, it's fairly innocuous. It, it, it has to do with the spectrum of fluctuations and how many saddles you have rather than the large end solution itself. Maybe one way of saying this is that if we are um, in one of these cases where these dipole transformations are continuous, so in, infinite volume in the continuum or infinite volume but on a lattice, then the, 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 the symmetry you can shift by D vector that corresponds to a zero mode in the spectrum of fluctuations around our large end solution. And when you path integrate over those fluctuations, you, you know, you have at least the theory is weakly coupled. So there's a bazillion modes that you, know, you have to do a bunch of Gaussian integrals, but then you have these zero modes and those zero modes will have either infinite volume or finite volume, uh, depending on whether you're talking about a continuum or a lattice. And that is a UV sensitivity that persists when we're talking about a prefactor to the partition function. In other words, that, which you can interpret as uh, how many states exist when you think of partition function as a state counting function. So here's the UVIR mixing, it's finally here. There's UV sensitivity in the spectrum of low energy states, but it's detected in this very simple way. What's the, say, the, the zero modes of these large end solutions? If instead we have a scenario where these uh, Ds are discrete, then we have many discrete saddles related by the symmetry. And what, instead of having a zero mode, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to sum up all the saddles, but they all contribute equally. So the partition function because they're related by symmetry. Yes. So since the model conserves you one charge, mm -hmm. uh, if we just look at a charge neutral sensor, mm -hmm. this is ah. really go away. Right. So we are right. So everything that I indeed. So yes, that's the short answer. Oh, sorry. Thank you. 
got myself used to giving Zoom seminars. I'm getting used to giving in-person seminars, but doing both at the same time is, <laughs> is a task. Uh, so the question that, uh, that Mong was asking was whether or not if we work in a charge neutral sector, if these issues go away. And the answer is yes. Um, the model that I'm writing down break, uh, how to say, you know, we're working in grand canonical ensemble. And the only way to realize zero density, zero charge uh, from our large end solutions is in fact on this, uh, this negative uh, chemical potential axis at zero temperature. That's the region in the phase diagram where you have exactly charge zero. And indeed there, that's also where we have no dipole breaking and we don't have this sum over cells. So it all is consistent. I won't say how long it took us to figure out that everything was consistent, but <laughs> it's all consistent. Um, so this last question, though, about the, the counting the number of states and the dipole algebra and all this, let's talk about this case where we have a, imagine a very, very fine grain lattice, but uh, in finite volume, finite, but very, very large volume. Well, in that case, the Ds, they're living in a space that is discrete. There's basically uh, Z with number of sites in the X direction, times Z with number of sites in the Y direction, and so on. And you sum up all those saddles. And what that does really is that, that um, the number of such saddles that you sum over is nothing more than the number of lattice sites. LX times LY times LZ, whatever. And what that means then is that when you look at the partition function, which is, uh, you know, you sum over these saddles, e to the minus s, and then, you know, Gaussian integrals for one loop fluctuations, um, there's a prefactor in front of the partition function that goes like number of lattice sites. As I said, this is the UVIR mixing. What it means too is that the density of states in this model um, is proportional to number of lattice sites, at least when the charge is not zero. And then uh, this is also consistent with the statement about the dipole algebra and the representation theory of it. In other words, this is uh, how to say this, this, this prefactor really is a consequence of the dipole algebra. And something that I, I still don't know how I think about it, but I'll, I'll make this observation and, and you can tell me what you make of it, is that you know, here we have UVIR mixing. That's a UV sensitive a uh, piece of physics in the density of states and the density of low energy states. Um, that sounds very jarring. However, from the point of view of this collective field theory, it's described like the path integral. It's really something quite prosaic. We have lots of saddles related by symmetry or we have some zero modes. And just if you want to carefully define what you mean by the sum over all those saddles, how many saddles there are, or what the field range of the zero mode is, then you have to kind of remember where this theory came from, its lattice uh, progenitor. Uh, okay, so let me keep going with some, since no one's stopping me with questions, I'll just keep going. I guess I'll end maybe a little bit early. Um, that's, I summarized many things that appeared in our paper uh, from a few months ago. And of course, we're doing lots of things to follow up. There's many things to do once you have this framework in hand. Uh, one direction that was uh, suggested to us by Nadia and his collaborators, um, I can't, well, maybe I do have the time to explain why. Um, <laughs> at finite end, these, uh, these many body quantum mechanics that I'm discussing, things with a single time derivative, they're actually a bit confusing. Um, basically because the Hamiltonian, the many-body Hamiltonian in these models, it's, it's quadratic in fields if, if you tune the chemical potential appropriately. So if you canonically quantize and introduce creation annihilation operators, have a many-body vacuum and so on, then the Hamiltonian has, you know, if you normal order, it's A dagger squared, A squared which has an enormous degeneracy. There's infinitely many states that are annihilated by that Hamiltonian generated by just acting with A daggers, as many A daggers as you want on the many body vacuum, as long as they're living at different sites. That is, I think um, that is a confusing feature. I don't think it contradicts anything that 
we discuss, in fact, I think it's resonant with the, what we find in uh, our large end models, basically because the states that we're looking at are states with uh, uniform charge densities. So the states that we're working around are, are very far from the many body vacuum. But you know, that being said, uh, one can study models that aren't quantum mechanics by just studying, uh, well, they are quantum mechanical models, but they're not in many body quantum mechanics um, by introducing terms with two time derivatives. That's something we're doing. Um, it sounds very simple, just do that. But once you do this, you're forced to confront all the issues that are kind of swept under the rug in summarizing the solutions to our models. You're, you're forced to confront all the details of regularization and renormalization and different schemes and really preserving the symmetries of the problem that you want to preserve, um, at least to leading order in large n. For us, in what we did in the many body quantum mechanics, what we did in practice, I didn't say this in the talk, but um, you know, someone could have pushed me on it. How did these, the various loop integrals that we have diverge and what do you do with the divergences? Uh, well, we had three different methods at the time that appear in the paper and we have a fourth now. So you can dim reg them because we have rotational symmetry. You can lattice regularize them. I did say this. Um, we also have a poly Villars regulator that renders in the, both in the, continu uh, in the continuum, the, these loop integrals completely finite. Um, or one could play the kind of conventional game with a momentum cutoff and then introduce uh, the momentum cutoff breaks the dipole symmetry. So then you have to add dipole symmetry breaking counter terms to restore the dipole symmetry in that regulatory scheme. But you can do all these different things and you land on the exact same results. This is what I presented earlier. When you have the two time derivatives, it's much more complex. Um, so for instance, uh, polyvolars is not enough to regulate all the divergences. Um, dim rank, uh, when you, well, you can use a momentum cutoff, but then you get very different results if compared with dim rank, there's sign discrepancies that appear. Uh, it appears that you know, in, with a momentum cutoff because it violates dipoles. I mean, you, you have to deal with all these kinds of things, I guess. <laughs> these technical questions that would appear in textbook field theory or in a quantum field theory course, you're forced to confront them now for these models. And it's a useful thing to do because then you can ask, well, um, it is a sort of a baby version of questions that came up in the panel yesterday about our G in the sense of, you know, you can ask how many um, counter terms do you have to tune at leading order in large N? What kind of, uh, how do operators be, you know, how do these operators behave? And the nice thing about large N is that it really truncates the problem, at least at leading order, you only have to worry about so many counter terms, so many operators. If you go to some leading order in one over N, then you know, these theories are really non-renormalizable effective field theories, as far as we can tell, and you have to deal with more and more counter terms, more and more operators have to be tuned. Um, but there seem to be a finite number at, uh, as, you, at, as you increase the order. Another thing that we're doing is to look at uh, large end models with subsystem symmetry. You can write down Lagrangians that have subsystem symmetry rather than dipole. You can solve the Dyson equations, find G sigmas, and well, it turns out you find qualitatively similar results to what I indicated with dipole symmetry in the sense of you find condensed phases and you find, well, not just dipole breaking phases, but subsystem breaking phases. Something else you can do just equally well as the models that I've been writing down. Instead of studying models of self-interacting bosons, you can write down models with self-interacting fermions and four Fermi interactions, gross nouveau type models. It's no harder, no easier than everything else I've said. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, something interesting that one can do is to couple this, this new phase, this one that we really needed to sum up uh, the interactions at, at leading order in large n, this dipole symmetric, but uh, di sorry, dipole non-symmetric, un symmetric, no condensate phase. Um, we can make a, a, at least in the infinite volume limit where you expect there to be uh, Goldstone bosons associated with the symmetry breaking. It's easy to write down a Lagrangian description uh, by symmetries of the problem for those dipole goldstones is very closely related to what Andy was doing 
in his talk, except he has those coupled to fluid modes as well. Um, you can write down that effective theory and you can ask, well, what happens now if you couple it to tensor gauge theory? Like what people do when they couple cyber child type theories to tensor gauge theories and see the physics of fractons come out. You can ask what happens in these other phases, um, what happens? Seems that you, well, and that is, okay, I guess I can say that's just work in progress. Seems that you still, you, the, having these dipole goldstones that Higgs is the tensor gauge theory, but it does leave some mat, um, massless matter behind, which renders questions of sort of if, you know, some partial TQFT description more subtle. Hopefully it's clear. I mean, I, I could just keep going with this list. There's a lot of things to be done. This is a very nice theoretical laboratory where we can study the role of interactions in these models uh, in, in a very controlled way that again, even I can do. Um, and so I hope that that sounds very interesting to you. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Is there any question in the audience? Um, so you mentioned some point in the talk that the auto parameter for this dipole breaking phase, uh, but UN symmetric, this new phase is uh, the bilocal green function. Uh, but naively, I mean, I, one, one would just think that the auto parameter is a kinetic term of the phi particle. Mm -hmm that breaks a dipole symmetry. And that looks like a local order parameter. It also has a derivative. Um, is that consistent with, with what you find? Um, all right, so yeah, let's see. Yeah, so the, the, the observation is that the ordinary grad phi squared is, oh, I guess all of you heard it because Mung and, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, I think that that's right. So I think the statement that I made, maybe I guess the, you're, you're pushing back on it was that there's not a local operator that would detect uh, the violation of dipole symmetry, but it's, it's UN symmetric. And that's a good point. I, 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 you may be right, actually. You can get that from a certain, uh, it, good. So the Green's function certainly does act as an order parameter, but you're saying maybe there's some good local order parameters. And I think you, I think, you're right, actually. Uh, one way of saying, you can get, of course, the expectation value of that from a certain coincident limit of the Green's function. And indeed, that coincident limit, um, you have to be a little uh, careful about, yeah, those coincident limits. There can be singularities that appear. At least in this setting, I think, if, I think here it works out just fine, actually. Space, yeah. I think it's picking out this term that I'm calling A1, the momentum dependent part of the self energy. There was a question in the Zoom. Oh, John. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, so I'm still I'm still a little confused about the symmetric phase in your phase mm -hmm. diagram. So, um, did did maybe I misheard, but. Uh, maybe I should just, should just ask what what is the spectrum of that symmetric phase? Is is it very very degenerate? This oh um, that degenerate phase. If you compute the charge, it's zero. In 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 phase three, I'm talking about hey, exactly. Time. Yeah yeah yeah. Oh sorry. What did... scratch whatever I said. I'm not even sure what I said. Um, the the insulating phase, the one that the symmetric one that you're asking about. The charge of that phase is, I, I think I did say this, for instance, along this, this negative uh, real axis. No, if that's not what I'm asking about. I'm asking about the large, large mu phase. Large mu phase. Um, has, I think it has charge, it has charge zero. And so then there's no, in other words, uh, then there, uh, from the representation theory point of view, you would expect there to be, um, 
uh, no state, how to say, a unique such state. There's no yeah, other yeah. states related to it by the dipole symmetry. I certainly agree. If there's no charge, then that's then that's consistent. But it's it's shouldn't I should I be surprised that if as you crank up the chemical potential larger and larger, the charge suddenly goes to zero? That's really weird. Yeah. These are lattice systems. So they have a finite, uh, how to say the, um, let's see. I guess in a fermionic system, you would have a finite number of states and then a, above a certain threshold, you would expect uh, there, there to be nothing anymore. Um, here, I mean, you're accessing very, what's a way of saying it? Uh, maybe a way of saying it is that at, the, at very extreme regions uh, in the, the density of states, very, very large energy, um, you actually have zero charge. And why that is, I don't understand a priori, it's, it's, a, it's a result. How does that come out in the bosonic system? That, that's surprising to me, right? In the bosonic system, it, naively, you could have arbitrarily large amounts of charge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this is, I don't, um, Oh, go ahead, Amir. Sorry, could you give him oh. the mic? Um, if I remember correctly, the insulating phase doesn't actually extend uh, into ah. the high mu phase, um, but they just kind of merge together um, at high. Uh, you say I okay. So you say I'm wrong, and that these two lines merge. Well, they, they kind of parallel each other. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Do you want to comment or? Um, maybe I'll take it back. But well, we should we should ask. So. Yeah, we should ask John, does that address the, con I, I mean, I agree there's a genuine question. <laughs> Naively expect there to be states of arbitrarily large energy, arbitrarily large charge. I guess there's a question of whether or not they're thermodynamically depend um, dominant, like higher density of states for, for those at leading order in large M. That depends on the dynamics of these models. And we're also, I mean, it's maybe I can, well, yeah, anyway, does that a, a address your question okay that helps yeah yeah i see thanks and maybe one comment too i i from a physical point of view these are i mean these we're, we're fortunate that at leading order in large m they look renormalizable really these are non-renormalizable effective theories i think is the right way to think about it and if we want to think about them as a good model of a physical system we would include many, many um, higher gradient corrections. And then, you know, the UV is that these extreme regions are going to be very, very sensitive to, to those higher, uh, higher gradient corrections. So what we're writing here, it's a little, you know, I'm presenting the results, but it's a little bit artificial. So, I, I, okay, so maybe a physical way to ask the question is, what do, what do you think happens at fixed N, at fixed, at fixed charge as they vary the temperature? Because the picture you have suggests that at high temperature, you know, something has to give, right? <laughs> right, right. I think at fixed N, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's very easy for for us or maybe for Amir to, <laughs> uh, to be able to uh, extract the density of states at fixed N. So, so you think you think that your your dipole breaking phases extend to arbitrarily high temperature if you fix the charge i guess that's is that the claim um i would yes i think what happened i my my physical intuition is that um at fixed non-zero charge at um well how to say i think what uh my sense is is that there is yeah, you you get you have in general a condensed phase at uh, low temperature, and then you pass to this uh, dipole breaking uh, phase at very uh, but UN symmetric phase at high temperature. Okay, that that, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. So you you, you restore the UN, but not the dipole. 
because you're looking at these necessarily because you're looking at non-zero charge. Great, I think the world is consistent. Thanks. Okay, there was another question in the audience. So related to this uh, question of universality at large, and um, given that the DT squared term uh, makes the regulators so much more subtle, um, would this phase diagram change qualitatively at all if you have both the linear and quadratic term at large n? The, the, the short answer is that we need to finish calculating. It's, uh, it, it, I mean, right now, I would, the only statement I would be able to make would be with half a sigma precision, I think at this point. So in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll know, but not yet. You mentioned these theories are non renormalizable. How do you know that? Is there a power counting that you see the uh, um, the coupling constant has negative dimensions? Or? Right. So, what I have in mind are two statements as far as the renormalizability goes. One is indeed a very naive power counting uh, definition. Uh, which would arise, I mean, for instance, in the model that I'm writing here, there's an emergent uh, scaling symmetry at high momentum, high frequency with Z equals two. And with respect to the, that scaling, the higher derivative, uh, this, this two derivative four phi term in the effective action is irrelevant with respect to that scaling. There's a, another thing that, of course, one can look at, which is, you know, how many counter terms do you have to, to tune in order to preserve symmetry, uh, how to define the theory below, at below some scale? And for the two point function, things are the Dyson equations that I wrote down, those are quite simple. But once you start considering loops, uh, for instance, you know, if you, um, if you were to think about the four point function in this model, then what you're doing is, um, this is gonna look really ugly, but you're, you're summing up things like this, just like in the vector model, where, where these are the external, and you sum over an arbitrary number of these, and you have the large n greens function running around the loops. Um, but now what happens is that unlike the ON models, the vertices are uh, polynomials in momenta. And so this is going to lead to more diver to divergences in the four point function. And then if you look at the six point function, there'll be divergences that will appear there that'll be different than there'll be, there'll be purely, uh, you know, things in five, six, and you can run that argument ad infinitum. So it'll be infinitely many counter terms that need to be tuned in order to define the all response functions in the theory below some scale. So in that, from that point of view, this is a non, but you know, the, the nice thing about large N is that this connected four point function is a one over N effect and the six point fun function is a one over N squared effect and so on. So to any fixed order in one over N expansion, you have a finite number of terms to deal with. Any question in the Zoom? In the audience? Okay, so I guess we can ping Christian again.